to Grace, Hope, Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel, Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. great to have you with us as together we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. This broadcast is reaching across the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. If you would like to partner with us to take the whole book to the whole world, please consider making a donation. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab your Bible and let's dig in. No, I'm kidding, of course. Oh, goodness, we can't go on together with suspicious minds. Um, so... <laughs> so this morning, Eldon's going to share with us. I've, you know, I've never gotten up here and and gotten off stage and thought that was that was a great introduction. Wow, you did a fantastic job. Um, I, I'm, I'm horrible at introductions, um, so I'm not going to belay this <laughs> long at all. Um, instead, I'm just going to immediately invite Eldon to come on up and share. Um, just want to remind you uh, that we do have the giving boxes in the back of the sanctuary. If you feel the Lord leading you to give to the work of the ministry, you can do that in those boxes very simply. And we have our Connect meeting this Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock here at the church. Um, and uh, I will be back sharing from Mark chapter 6 this coming Sunday. But this morning we have the pleasure of Eldon coming up and sharing with us. So come on up, El Eldon. I think the best place to start this morning is in prayer. <laughs> Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for each person that has taken this time out of their week to spend some time with you and your family. Father, thank you for this place. place where your throne room is open to us. And so, Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we want to be a blessing to you. We want to learn from you. And, and we want to rejoice in having been here today. We want to glorify Christ with all that we say and do in this place today. And we ask your blessing in all of that, and I ask that you'd keep me out of the way, and that you would give me your words as we open your word together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So our primary text this morning is 1 Peter chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, you can open that, or device, or whichever, however you want to get there. There's Bibles back here somewhere if you need one, and take one if you don't have a Bible. 1 Peter 3. And, and by way of review... I have been trying to get into the verse by verse, chapter by chapter. That is hard to do when you only teach every three or four months. But <laughs> I am trying. So uh, we're, we're going to be in, in chapter three. But in, in review, and, and we're going to take some short, some basically pretty extensive diversions getting there this morning. The theme of First Peter is grace. And we see that in, in 1 Peter 5.12. He says, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. And of course we know that, that mercy means not receiving the judgment we deserve, but grace. Grace goes so much further than not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting so much more than we do deserve. And so we put grace and mercy together. Mercy is I'm a sinner, and I deserve death and judgment, but I'm not going to get that. That's mercy. Grace is all the other stuff. So I, I, I tend to like um, biscuits and gravy, and I like biscuits in general, but you know when you put the gravy on top, it, it just really makes that biscuit so much better. 
And, and, and so we have mercy, and then we have grace just poured all over that mercy. And, and Peter says, I want you to know the grace of God. And then we want to know how that grace affects us. And, and so in, in the um, outline, and I didn't create this. This was out of one of my other Bibles. Uh, there's an outline of First Peter. Grace means security. You look at what it means to be a child of God and to be secure in our faith. And, and then grace means sobriety or to exercise self-control. And, and then we, we read under, under that that we are to exercise self-control in holiness and in reverence and in love and in growth in our relationship with him and with each other. Grace means submission. And then there's a summary of, kind of wraps all that up in a couple of verses, and then he quotes some stuff from the Psalms. And, and then grace means suffering. And then grace means service. If, if we've had experienced the mercies of God, where we know that our sins have been forgiven, and, and then we start living in the grace that he brings into our life, then, then we should be able to submit to him, and we should be able to suffer for him, and we should be able to serve him. And, and so grace in our lives should be very profound and very manifest. And, and so as, as that, that's what Peter was writing about. So as we come to 1 Peter chapter 3, one of the first things that's going to be said there is, wives, submit to your husbands. Now, that is a lousy way to start a message. And, and so we're not starting there. We're going to go to, the, you kind of keep your finger there. I'm not going to ask you to look all these up, but there's some stuff up here on the wall. Colossians 3.12 through 14 says, So... As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, in parentheses, forgive them. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond, of unity. Remember we talked last time about how when the scripture says put on, it's like taking off dirty clothes and putting on clean ones. He, he talked about um, all of the, the malice and anger and all the things that our world is so full of. And he says, just put all that aside. Like taking off a dirty garment. Put it aside and put on the righteousness of God. And so we come back to that same mindset here where we're putting on now a heart of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And, and then he, he says that at the end of that passage, put on love which is the perfect bond of unity. And then just a, a, a few verses um, a few chapters later, and I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians, I got tripped up over my notes. In 1 Colossians 13, he says, Now abide faith, hope, love, and these three, but the greatest is love. The greatest is always love. In, in Colossians 3.15, Paul wrote, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To which you were called. That, that's what God called you for, to experience and live in that peace of him that only he can bring. And be thankful. And let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And, and so here we come back to the Trinity again. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to the Father. So we, we've talked about the Trinity being Father, God, and Son, uh, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each God in his own entity, in his own personhood, makes up the, the one 
triune God. One plus one plus one equals one in God's math. And we will never understand that until we get to heaven. I don't know if I'll understand it then either. But in God's math, God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit, separate entities become one in the um, divine singular plurality of Elohim. So each may be worshipped. We can worship the Father. We can worship Jesus as the Son. We can worship the Holy Spirit as that which accomplishes God's purpose throughout the world. But in, if, if we come to the true theology of prayer, we pray to the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that, that's the theology of prayer. And while we can, well, I said, as I said, we can pray to either one. We can worship the, the, the Father. We can worship the Son. We can worship the Holy Spirit. We can pray to each of them. It doesn't matter. But we have access to the Father because of the Son's blood for us. If it weren't for Jesus dying on the cross, we wouldn't have access to the Father. And he now sits at the right hand as our mediator, our intercessor. And the Holy Spirit lives in us and conveys our needs and our emotions. And, and, and Paul even says at one point, we get to this place where our emotions are just so tangled up in doubt and fear and pain that we don't even know how to pray. We can't verbalize. Sometimes people ask me, well, how are you doing? I don't know. I can't verbalize to you in this context how I'm doing. It's just not going to work. And so when I come to God... And I, I get on my knees in front of him, and my heart just, I can't express what's in my heart. Paul says, in that place, in that moment, the Holy Spirit will take that inexpressible something and take it to God for us through Jesus Christ. Jesus is our mediator. He's our access to God the Father, the Spirit in us, is the power in our prayers. And this is why when we pray, Jesus told us before he left his disciples, he said, so far you haven't asked for anything from the Father, but as I leave you, know that, that you don't have because you don't ask. But if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will do it. And that's why we pray in Jesus' name. He is our mediator. He is the source, the pipeline, the conduit through which our spirit brings our prayers into the holy throne room of God. Paul goes on to say in Colossians, So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, Put on, see, there's that put on again. Put on a heart of compassion. I read that already. Turn the page. Colossians 3.18. Here we get into a little bit more of the you know, wives. Be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Slaves or employees, in all things, obey those who are your masters or your employer on earth. Not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, serving the Lord in awe. And whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Now we got wives being subject to husbands and children being obedient to parents and we'll kind of lump all this together in one thing here in a minute. Ephesians 5, 18, and 30, 18 through 30. This is all introduction, by the way. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another. There's that subject to one another again in the fear of Christ. 
or the reverence for Christ. Wives, again, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, and this is where it gets flipped, husbands love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. And like that, like Christ did that for us as a church, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. That is a task I didn't know I was signing up for, sweetheart. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. I I don't know how many of you are aware with organizational flowcharts, but it always starts with a little box up on top with somebody in charge. And then it delegates down through all the little box and blo- boxes and, and, and all of the, the So this guy wants something that goes to these people and it goes to those. And it, it's just, this is the organization flowchart. So what Paul and Peter are presenting to us this morning is a flowchart of authority. Christ is the head of all. The church needs to submit to Christ because he's the head of the church. We are his body. He is the head. He provides all direction, all um, guidance. Uh, Christ, the head of the church. So the church, we, we must submit to Christ as the head of the church. Or we're not Christ's church or we're going to be a very uncomfortable, dissatisfied church as we try to do our own thing instead of his thing. The church must submit to the authority of God. Well, the, 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 the term submit in the, the Greek compares to uh, a soldier that, that has to come to his commanding officer and submit to his authority. That soldier uh, has another command, and it all goes up to one guy being in charge, but all the soldiers have to submit to the the officer above them. And that's the the, the Greek term for submission, is to align yourself in your proper place under authority. And and so as the church comes to Christ as the head of this body, we need to be submitted and committed to what God wants for this church. The church cannot submit to God if every single one of us as members is not. I can't live a life of disobedience to God six days a week and then come here and find God's purpose for his church. It's not going to work that way. We have to submit as individuals, members of one another, members of his church, submit to him. And then we all get along great. There's no problems in the church. If there is a, a beginning of a hurt feeling, it gets dealt with. When each of us are committed to Christ as the head of us, then the church is free to function in, as recognizing God, Christ as our head. See how that, that works? We have to bring our submission here so that together we can all submit to God. And, and, and if, if, if some are submitted to God and some are committed to themselves and we start clashing over what we ought to do next, God is not glorified. And, and so each of us needs to submit to God, because Jesus is the head of the church. And and so now we have the church, and we have the individuals of it. We have men, we have women, 
We have employers and employees, husbands, wives, children, all of these people in each whatever capacity of the, wherever their station in life is, as it's sometimes put. All of these people. Pastor submits to the, 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 the deity and the authority of Christ. The elder submits to the church and to the deity of Christ. The people in the church the employers submit to their masters as if it was unto God. See that? We, we, we do our jobs, 40 days, or whatever number of hours a week it is now, to an employer as if it was God himself who has given us a royal assignment to go punch that time clock. It makes a big difference in how you approach your job. But you see, we're starting to get a grasp on submission, aren't we? And, and so now, it says, in, in Ephesians, Paul is talking about marriage. And he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one. And where was that? God's math again. One plus one equals one. And, and Paul says, this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to the church. And, and to, I'm, I'm sorry, speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. There's something, you see that, that mystery in the middle of that passage? You know what that mystery is? God, through Jesus Christ and the church, we are his bride. Now, how, how do we get our mind around that? How can we visualize the relationship that Jesus wants to have with us, the intimacy of it? What, what is there in our realm, which the physical that we can see, what is there that is going to allow us to glimpse a little bit of how we are so special to God as his bride. The church is the bride of Christ. There's my bride. I am supposed to be as enamored as with her as Christ is with us. I am supposed to be Jesus to her. She is supposed to see Jesus in me. And, and I don't know how to do that unless I submit to him first. It's all about submission. So you see, when, when I submit to God as my authority, when I become the influence in my wife's life that she needs for me to be, she's going to be coming to me saying, how can I more submit completely to you because I want to honor God in our relationship more? And in that relationship between her and me, if I'm doing my job right, she's going to love submitting to me because I am the one that's doing things and bringing this spirit into our home. If I'm submitted to God, she doesn't have any problem submitting to me. It's going to be a pleasure for her. It's when I get full of myself that submission becomes a problem. When I get full of myself, I don't want to serve God. I don't want to submit to Him. I don't want to submit to her, which is part of this too. And, and so these passages that start out with, wives, submit to your husbands. That's not where we start. Husbands start by loving his wife the way Christ loved the church. I don't have that in me. And so I must submit to Christ so that He can flow his love and his mercies to her through me. When I see my role as husband from that perspective, marriage gets kind of easy. It's when I get focused on me that marriage gets hard. But when my marriage is focused on Christ. Our marriage is focused on Christ. It's easy. Well, easier. <laughs> so I wanted to do, oh, that's a long introduction as we get to 1 Peter 3. But I didn't want to start with wives submit to your husbands. I wanted to start with the church and its members submitting to Christ first. And me doing my role first. 
And then when I'm doing my role right, Paul says, and, and Peter, if a man can love his wife the way Christ loved the church, she won't need to be told to submit. And that, guys, that's on us. And, and I, I had a, a co-worker in Vista that used to just beat his wife with that verse. I'm the boss. You submit to me. And I thought, Johnny, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's not how it's supposed to work. If you come home from work every night with this verse and beat your wife about the head and shoulders with it, that you know, she hasn't done the right thing, she hasn't done it the right way, and, and she, she needs to do it better, and all, she's not going to submit to that. It's not going to work. And, and so I wanted to set that stage for all of us being submitted to God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit. That's where our life is. And now as we actually come to 1 Peter... Chapter 3. Uh, we go back to uh, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. You have been called for this purpose. Christ suffered. Now we're moving more from the marriage thing into the suffering part, which sometimes seems like the same thing, but it isn't. You have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he offered, offered, uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And, and so as chapter 2 ends right there, with the, the suffering of Christ, Peter now moves into chapter 3 and verse 1 in the same way as that, in the same way as Christ went to the cross without complaint. Wives are supposed to be submissive to their husbands. Now, if I would have started with that, we'd be going a totally different direction now, wouldn't we? So, I didn't do that. That's why we had the long introduction, was to avoid this being where we started. And here's the purpose. In the same way, wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, both to God and to them. Respect your God, submit to him, and that will allow you to respect a husband that doesn't deserve it. He's still a husband. Respect that. While a wife cannot transform her husband by nagging, fussing, or complaining, God can use. God can transform a husband as he observes his wife's pure and reverent behavior. And then he says, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold, jewelry, putting on dresses and fine apparel. But it let it be the adornment let your adornment be the hidden person of the heart. The hidden person of the heart. You know, only you and God know that. Only you and God know the hidden person of the heart. But Paul, Peter says, do whatever you can to, to submit to God through Jesus Christ. Submit to your husband's authority over you because that's what Christ calls you to. But let that internal adornment of the heart, that, that imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is so precious in the sight of God, for in this way, in, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. In Genesis 18, a, a Christophany came to Abram, and, and he says, 
in one year, we'll, I'll come by this way again, and your, you and your you and your wife will have had a son. And and Sarah's in the tent laughing like, <laughs> yeah, right. After I have become old, shall I also have pleasure, my Lord, being also old also? And and in in the, and the, she's just talking to herself in the tent, but she's recognizing that Abraham is her Lord, so to speak. And I don't require of Kim that she calls me any kind of you know. We're honey and sweetheart. We're not lord and master over anything. I, uh, but she did recognize it, it, to herself in the tent, shall I, after I become old, shall I have pleasure also my lord, being old also. And, and then he says, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she's a woman. Wouldn't get very far preaching that on a street corner, would I? Uh, and and I frankly I don't know what to do with that. Of, of, of weaker physically, weaker uh, logically. I don't I don't know. Uh, I I probably shouldn't say this, but you'll laugh, so I will. I, I I read that every relationship has a psychological element to it. One is logical, the other one's psycho. And so you have the psycho and you have the logical and God has put them together and said be one. The trick is to not try to figure out which is which at any given time in your relationship. Live with your wives in an understanding way. As with someone weaker since she is a woman. And show her honor as a fellow heir of grace. Remember where we started was each of us before the throne of God as individuals submitting to Him. And, and so at this point, we're all before the throne worshiping God. She's not my wife. She's my sister in Christ. And I need to care for her as a sister in Christ and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that my prayers may not be hindered Guys, have you ever wondered God just doesn't seem to be responding to your prayers and your concerns and your issues? And, and, and you have to kind of like go back and say, what, what is it in my life that's keeping me my prayers from getting to God? Well, maybe i got a bad attitude towards my wife. Because Peter says that if i got a bad attitude towards my wife, it will hinder my prayers. And, and so we have to in, in all of our prayers and all of our concerns and all of our issues, we need to treat our wives, gentlemen, as an equal before the throne of grace. And then, then to kind of sum all that up, he says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious. Okay? Sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Doesn't that make you feel good? You were, God called you. I want you. I want you, to, I want you. I want you to come into my family and let me adopt you so I can bless you. You were called that you might inherit a blessing. And then he quotes from Psalm 34. For the one who desires life, to love and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And then verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? It might, define, might depend on how we define harm. Uh, there, there are a lot of different ways that harm can be done to my body. And, and, and we're told that if, if, if we're on the front line of the battlefield in kingdom ministry, that we will suffer persecution for it.
but I've come to, to believe at this point in my life that whatever harm may be done to this body, it can't hurt my soul. And, and when God's through with this body, with my, no, as I said before, someday God's going to say, Eldon, you've, you've just finished your last assignment, come home. And I, I can spend the rest of the day listing martyrs who have literally given their life to not bow down to an idol. And we see in, in Daniel 3, 17 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego talking to Nebuchadnezzar about his demand that they fall down and worship his golden idol. And, and so they, they, they come to Nebuchadnezzar and say, our, if, if our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. None of us have ever been faced with that kind of persecution. But we have brothers and sisters all over the world that are, even in this moment, being challenged to deny Christ or die. And we have brothers and sisters all over the world dying today because they would not defile the name of Jesus Christ. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? In this realm, you might suffer some pain, but true harm? We're in the hand of Jesus, and our souls are intact and secured forever. And, and when, the, the more we can realize how temporary this life really is, um, the easier it is to say, well, kind of what will be will be. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not going to go looking you know, for circumstances that might harm me, but if, if, there is, if I do suffer harm in serving Christ, there's a whole list of people uh, in the Scripture and in history that have walked into that harm and gone home to be with Jesus. And what kind of harm is that? if that's really our goal, to live for him. As uh, Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What is there really in this life to harm us? But even if you should suffer, in verse 14, if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear their intimidation, do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Christ is holy. He is God. He is man. He's supposed to be sanctifying me. How is it that I sanctify him? He is so far apart. That's what sanctified means. Holy, sanctified. He is so far removed and set aside from anything I know that I don't know how to describe him. I can't visualize him. He is different than anything I've ever seen. I don't have words to describe him because I've never seen him anyway. And if I did see him, I still wouldn't have words to describe him. He is so far beyond anything I know. And Peter says, sanctify him in your heart. And, and I see a lot of things in my heart. Scripture says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Or is it vice versa? Anyway, I, I get these things in my heart that want to take God off the throne. And, and I, I must purify my heart, my eternal soul, the center of my eternal existence. I need to cleanse anything that would not set Christ apart. He is to be the only thing in my the, the, the heart of my soul that is in charge. And, and anything, as is, is, is we read in the Ten Commandments, have no other gods before me. We sanctify Christ in our hearts when we take everything else out and just let him be the God of our life that he wants to be. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you.
sorry, be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you and yet with gentleness and reverence. Our, our, I, I remember so many times I've, I've shared the gospel in anger or hostility or um, arrogance. And that doesn't work. It never will. We, we, we have to share the gospel of Christ. We have to have a testimony that gives honor to Christ. And we have to be able to share it with gentleness and reverence to him so that he can use that testimony to bring glory to himself. And, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. I haven't been slandered for a while. There are some people that have some misguided ideas of who they think I might be, but... Um, I, I, I don't think that I... I haven't been slandered personally um, by that. In, in, the, in the corporate world, there are people that will do anything to climb the corporate ladder. And there are others that don't care to climb the corporate ladder. And I've always felt that if I'm doing my job unto Christ, it's not about the ladder. It's about Him. And, and I've, I've gotten a lot of uh, negative feedback over being that kind of person in the workplace. And I'll, I'll, real quick short story. Our, our boss for a while was the owner's oldest son, and he came to me with this piece of paper for the county of San Diego. And he said, we all need to sign this, that um, I gave a, a hazardous waste material handling seminar, and you were all there, and you, I need to, for you to sign this. And I said, Kervin, I'll sign that right after we have the course. And he said, well, I'll just tell him you were here that day. And he walked away and got everybody else to sign the form. Sometime after that, uh, well, Kervin decided he'd rather be a surfer than a, a manager of a factory, I became the manager of the factory because I was there doing the job. And, and it wasn't because I wanted to be in charge or because somebody had to do the job. and Nobody was doing the job. And, and so in that, that thing where I was being slandered as the, oh, the goody two-shoes, the one that won't sign the form, and the one that won't do this, and, and, and yet standing up to the management as not being one that will lie for them. I became management. Scripture says that if you will humble yourself, Christ will exalt you. And that wasn't in my notes, but it's in my brain. As we submit to God for the sake of furthering His kingdom, He will exalt us. That's Scripture. He will exalt the humble. He will take down the proud. That, that, that's scripture. That's just one example of, of people looking at something that I'm doing in the marketplace and for what they perceive to be the wrong reasons, and then it works out to my benefit, and I'm getting glorified, and I wasn't after that at all. I was just serving God. We serve God in our lives. As we are going, serve God. He will bless you for that. But we are submitting to him. And then he says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And don't fear them. Don't be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. With reverence and gentleness. And keep a good conscience so that in that thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it's better, if God should will it, that you suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. If it's going to hurt, do it anyway. If it's going to cost you something, do it anyway. God knows how to keep score. But let our conscience be right as we submit to God.
let our conscience be right as we go about our lives. And then we get to verse 18 in 1 Peter 3. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Christ died once for all, so that he might bring us to God as his bride. And as he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, he also went down and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. Spirits now in prison. Who were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is to say eight people, were brought safely through the the water or through the judgment. The population of the earth was judged for their sins, and only those that took faith in the ark and got in it were saved from the judgment of God. Does that sound familiar to you? There's a day coming where God will say, it's time for my bride to come home. And and there are those who what am I going to go with this? I, I read s- several commentaries. I think I have five that were involved in all of this. But um, at least a couple of them said that this passage and the one b- next are, is, is the single hardest passage in the New Testament to interpret. <laughs> well, okay, Lord, I'll give it a shot. So I don't know if I'll, this will... Settle right. I don't know how this will land, but let's take a shot at it. Christ died on the cross. And his body was in the tomb, but as we know, eternal souls don't die. And so Christ, in that three days, that his body was in the tomb. He went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. If we go back to um, Luke 16, Jesus told the story of Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And, and, and we see a, a place of peace and pleasure and contentment on one side, and we see the flames on the other side, and we see the rich, um, rich man saying, would you send Lazarus with just a drop of water to cool my tongue? That place is called Hades. And, and if, if we stand the, the cross, we've got a cross back here. Look at that cross as before the crucifixion, after the crucifixion. Before the crucifixion, we had the prophets telling people that a Messiah will come to remove the sins of the people. And and we read in Hebrews where these people all became heroes of the gospel because they believed that God would send a Savior. And so they looked forward to the cross. But Christ hadn't died yet. Now this may be wrong, and it may not fit right in your theology, but this is kind of what I do with it. Um, In that three days, I believe that God went to the hell side, that Jesus went to the side of hell, where the unbelievers are, and he said, I have gained the victory. It is finished. And then he went to the other side and he said, let's go see Dad. And he took those people with him. Remember the thief on the cross? He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Christ say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. And and so all those people that maybe weren't with God yet are now the gates open. And and so I think that during that three days, that's what happened. I think that that we see um, the the, the non-resurrected Christ going into that place and preaching his victories to the ones that are still in judgment, but bringing the others to paradise with him. Um, We can, if you disagree with that, you can let's let's get together. Corresponding to that now, he says, 
Baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. And remember, all those people that were on that side of the cross got baptized. The baptism of John. And, and Jesus got baptized by John. And so what was that all about? I know why I got baptized. Why did they get baptized? The people that repented of their sins and accepted by faith that Christ would send a Messiah to cover their sins, even though they're dying in their sins, they knew Christ would forgive them if they believed. And, and that, that list in Hebrews says all of these people gained favor with God through faith, through just simply believing that he would send a Messiah. And, and we look back to the cross as the Messiah having been sent. But all of us, they look to the cross, we look back at the cross, but everyone who, was ever going, who we will ever see in heaven believed in the cross, believed in the death of Messiah. Baptism now saves you. And I struggled over that one for a long time. That doesn't fit in my theology at all. So let, let's kind of look around a little bit. In Acts 19, Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance saying to people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament believers baptized into something they believed would come because God said so. In, in Matthew, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And that's another one that's puzzled me for a long time. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? Because Jesus, well, here's what, what I've got so far. Jesus was a man. And as a man had to submit to the requirements of the events that were about to happen. And, and his baptism was a picture of his death and his resurrection and, and his sacrifice for us. Our baptism, when we go under the water, we are dying to ourselves. and We are associating ourselves with Christ's cross by picturing ourselves under the water being dead to ourselves. And then we come up out of the water alive, made new in Christ to serve God. And so we are Buried with Christ, raised to new life in Him. And Jesus was saying when He got baptized, I am going to die and be buried and I'll be raised again. And the people in the Old Testament that were getting baptized by John said, we haven't seen Him yet, but there's a Messiah coming and we want to repent and be ready for Him when He gets here. But, if we look, that doesn't help us at all to deal with the fact that baptism now saves you. And he goes on to say, not the removal of dirt from flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is now at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. And, and the thing, I was struggling. How do I deal with that? Baptism now saves me. It doesn't fit. In, in Luke 12, Jesus, talking to his disciples and his apostles, said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. This is after his water baptism. He's talking about the baptism of the cross. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Therefore, in Romans, Paul says, we were buried with him through baptism into death, 
So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And, and so we go back to our, our verse in Peter. Baptism now saves you. Remember that the G, we just talked in verse 19, Jesus went down to Hades and he preached to the prisoners on that side and he rescued the, one, the, the, the ones that were waiting on them. Not that they were prisoners, but they were in a different place. Um, corresponding to that, Christ's baptism into death saves not my baptism that saves me, it's his. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and I'm distressed until it's accomplished. That's Jesus, that's our Savior saying, I have to go to the baptism of the cross, and I'm distressed over it. And, and we are baptized into the Holy Spirit by believing that what he did on the cross can save me from my sins. And, and it's all about submission and grace. It's about coming to God saying, I'm a sinner and I need your mercy. And I, I, I accept the fact that Jesus Christ died for me on the cross. I believe in Jesus Christ being my Savior. My sins are dealt with. I'm free from the penalty of all of that. But my baptism into his death and his resurrection is supposed to change how I live. And I'm supposed to live in submission to him as I serve my wife so that she can submit to me so that the world around us can see that this marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. When the world around us sees our marriage, we should be an example to them of Christ and his church. God hates divorce. God hates anything that messes with that unity because it's a disrespect of him and a relationship that he wants to portray. Remember, and this isn't in my notes either, but you'll remember that Moses, when he struck the rock, was supposed to speak to it. And, and so we, we have to do God's thing, God's way. And there's no way to avoid the fact that God's way is submission. Again, as, as uh, the theologian uh, Bob Dylan said, you've got to serve somebody. Everybody's got to serve somebody. And God says, if you submit to me while you're serving them, they will see something in you that they haven't seen in anybody else. You'll be different. Because you'll be serving God as you serve them. If, if, you want, if, if I've struck a nerve or a chord, I said something you disagree with, let's talk about that. If, uh, if you've never experienced salvation through the blood of Christ, if you've never just said, God, I'm a sinner, I want you to save me, I need you desperately to save me, let's talk about that. Anything. Sean, Larry, me, whatever, pick your... Pick your person that most easily talked to and work it out. Pastor Sean, would you like to close today for us? Let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time we've had studying your word together. Lord, we just ask that your word would do as you have promised that will do, that will not return void. Lord, help us to live lives uh, that are pleasing to you, that, that, uh, that we may 
live well and experience uh, a blessed life just as you have um, provided for us, Lord. Um, if we have um, persistent sinful activity in our life, Lord, I pray that we would repent of that. Um, not that we are losing our salvation through any action we do, Lord, but that we want to live pleasing to you, Lord, but also that we will live uh, uh, blessed by you and we can look forward to those amazing rewards that you have for those who are faithful to you in heaven. Lord, thank you for uh, this beautiful morning that you've given us uh, for the, the change of the seasons. Lord, you've provided for us in so many ways and you continue to provide. Father, help us to um, glorify you in that provision. We thank you for the friends that you have placed alongside us, those who uh, travel this life with us and um, help us not to take them for granted, um, but to uh, consider them as we go through our day, uh, to pray for them. If we haven't heard from them, Lord, that we would contact them and, and see how they're doing. And um, Lord, that we would just uh, be brothers and sisters to one another in such a way as is pleasing to you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. We pray this in the uh, precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Everyone said, Amen. The object of of faith is not the gospel, my friend. The object of faith is Jesus. Being at peace with God is, is not automatic because you by nature are separated from God. The Bible says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we are both sinners. Every person is a sinner and sin, our sin, separates us from God. Sincerity, morality, good works, a religion, these are some of the ways that man has tried to close the gap between himself and God. Only God's love can close that gap of separation between himself and you. He paid the penalty for the sins of the world. The Bible says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Apostle reiterated this in 1 John 2, where we read this, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Because of this, despite the fact that we are sinners, we are not blocked from God and from His kingdom because of our sin. He has removed the sin barrier so that now we are all savable. All we need to do to have everlasting life with God, life that can never be lost, is to believe in Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus very plainly says that whoever believes in him will not perish, but has everlasting life. Because of the cross and the, the resurrection of Jesus, all who simply believe in him have everlasting life and will one day be raised from the dead to live physically forever in perfect glorified bodies. I can be absolutely sure 
that I have everlasting life because I know it has nothing to do with how good or bad I am and everything to do with Jesus' faithfulness to his promise. You crossed that bridge into God's family when you believe in Jesus Christ. And God invites you to believe and freely receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life that can never be lost. Thank you for listening. Remember to be a doer of the Bible and not just a hearer. That means demonstrating God's love to others as He has so abundantly poured out His love into your life. Most importantly, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision you could ever make. Choose your destiny. Don't let the world choose it for you. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and click on God to learn more about God's plan for your life. If you prayed to receive Jesus through this program, please let us know. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and select contact. While you're there, please consider sowing into this ministry by selecting donate. You have been listening to Grace Hope Love with Pastor Sean Bumpers and Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Thank you, my friend, for your fellowship, and may the Lord abundantly pour out His grace, hope, and love into your life.